Hey everybody, welcome to the channel. Michael Noland here. Tonight we're gonna be covering the Coverdale Page album and specifically this is going to be fitting in to my Led Zeppelin Decoded series, all right? So if you're behind in that series or you haven't caught up on it yet, take a look at my playlist section and of course Led Zeppelin Decoded is located there. All right, like Robert Plant, the reason I am covering uh, Jimmy Page's uh, solo album here is because, well, Led Zeppelin, the story continues after the death of John Bonham in many ways, doesn't it? Whether that has been a collaboration between Plant and Page uh, a couple of times, or whether it's all three members getting back together with John Bonham's son, Jason Bonham, and putting on one last concert, the story can't help but continue. Now, you know, when this album came out, it was a very interesting time, not only historically speaking, but uh, for me personally as well. You see, in my 30s, I had decided to finally go to college and I had uh, gotten past that, had gotten into the martial arts. And, and when this album came out, I was about as far away removed from any of my musical past but didn't know that I was coming heads on with a musical future. And I was really excited about some of the newer music, the grunge aspect of rock and roll. And by the way, much of what we're gonna be covering in tonight's video will be from a uh, press conference where the press questioned both David Coverdale and Jimmy Page quite extensively. But you know, when I heard this album, I'll tell you what I think of this album in general. This has got to be one of rock and roll's best albums that you can put on in a car as you're driving down the freeway. And the longer your trip is, the more enjoyable that trip is gonna be. You know, back in those days, I was driving between Santa Rosa, California and Sacramento, the capital, and these were long trips because to me, this album is just one of those road albums that sounds the best in a car, properly balanced for the driver, of course. You know, it's interesting. One of the things that they kept saying at this press conference was that this was by no means a gathering together of these two forces by way of corporate structure. In other words, they both had connections to the same record label, and there was a record executive involved in getting these two together. But it was from the very start, a project that both Jimmy and David saw clearly as, well, let's wait and see. Actually, David Coverdale at this point was even contemplating retiring from music. Certainly, he was going to take an extended period of time off. And the year prior to him and Jimmy meeting up, there had been tons of rumors regarding Led Zeppelin getting back together. Now, this was a time period where at first, Robert Plant had made some verbal uh, assertions that he might very well be interested in such a reunion. But later in the discussions, he felt that uh, touring with Led Zeppelin as Led Zeppelin would have been uh, detrimental to his solo career, which evidently tells us that this would not have been a permanent realignment of Led Zeppelin, even if it had happened. So when this album was first released, and this album, by the way, its success cannot be denied. It was a hit album for both of these guys. But there was a diverse opinion from the critics as to whether this was a good album or not. Some said it was far too derisive of Led Zeppelin, and some even complaining that David Coverdale was just there to sound 
like Robert Plant. And unfortunately, it didn't help when at the time Robert Plant made some very negative comments uh, about uh, David Coverdale uh, trying to sound like him. And uh, of course, Jimmy replied that Robert was being far too short-sighted with the whole project and he wasn't getting what it was all about and Coverdale even saying that he felt stabbed in the back because him and Robert had been friends prior to this project. Others would say that this sounded like a blend of White Snake and Led Zeppelin and that it was okay. And yet other critics thought it was an excellent album and that it fit perfectly, especially in the early 90s against the grain of some of the more grunge sounding rock bands. As a matter of fact, both David and Jimmy were asked at this press conference what they thought of the new grunge feel to rock and roll. Now, David Coverdale said, ah, oh, man, to me it sounds like they're getting back to the basics. He loved it, and he even compared them to some of the Yardbirds material. And you know what? There is some grunge feel to some of the Yardbirds material. Very astute, David. And of course, Jimmy replied, hey, it's got guitars. What can I say? So he loved the whole sound too. Both of these artists showing that they were in touch with the very latest that rock and roll had, and yet they offered this product that didn't quite sound like the 80s stuff that we had heard from Plant, uh, not too far off from that, but it sounded a bit more updated, and yet not quite offering that more edgier sound that grunge was offering at the time. Now, personally, me, I was really into grunge. I love some of those bands coming out of Seattle. I thought, wow, yes, rock and roll still has places to go. But when this album came out, you know, my natural thoughts on this album was it didn't sound dated at all, not from the get-go. And uh, it just had a wonderful, uh, touring sound, if you know what I mean. Now, like I said, uh, some critics of this album said that David Coverdale just sounded far too close to uh, Robert Plant's style of singing. And you know, there are parts on this album that you could swear for a moment that it's Plant. But I'd have to say that 70% of the time on this album, David Coverdale doesn't sound a bit like Robert Plant. As a matter of fact, he even acknowledged that at that press conference where he said Jimmy would constantly get him to growl up his voice. Thus that sound that we hear on this album. One critic saying he just sounds like a growly Robert Plant. Uh, I don't agree with that. Uh, Jimmy has a natural proclivity to explore certain areas on his guitar. It drives a lead vocalist into the upper ranges. And of course, David Coverdale had practically the same range as Robert Plant, and he even acknowledged that in this press conference, that he would feel like he had no choice but to go into that register, which explains a whole lot of how Led Zeppelin developed their style. Now, you know, for the most part, I think David Coverdale sounds like David Coverdale. Now, I'm not real familiar with Whitesnake, and I'm going to get familiar so that I, uh, I can do a comparison of them later on. You know, when Whitesnake came out, I had heard they were like Led Zeppelin, and at that period of, t of my life, I wasn't really looking for another Led Zeppelin band. So I eschewed from anything from Whitesnake. But I was a fan of David Coverdale and I loved him when he took over the vocal ranges for Deep Purple. And you know, like I've said in prior videos, I think that if Tommy Bolin had lived, David Coverdale had stayed with Deep Purple, that band could have taken off in a completely different direction. They were already heading in that direction when Tommy died and of course David was no longer with the project. But you know, on the Coverdale Page album, I hear vocals that sound closer to his work with Deep Purple than anything. And you know, like I said, I am a fan of Deep Purple, and I'm even a fan of that incarnation, 
of Deep Purple. Another thing that was brought up at the press conference was that all of this music was written on acoustic guitars. With David Coverdale joining in on guitar, he says he was nothing more than an auxiliary guitarist to begin with and that it was quite daunting to sit there with a guitar and Jimmy Page, of all people, in front of him. And I can only imagine that that was so. But he did want to lend and have something to do with where the guitar went and or at least to understand it with his understanding of guitar so that his vocal approach would be appropriate for the tune. Now another question that was brought up at the press conference was when did they know that some of these songs would actually have a more heavy rock uh, feel to them since it was all written uh, on acoustic guitar. And Jimmy, right to the point, said, oh no, we knew what was electric and what was going to be basically acoustic right from the get-go. He said he could just hear it in his head even if he was on acoustic guitar. Ha <laughs> ha, the magician, Jimmy Page, my favorite guitarist of all time. And another thing that they brought up at that press conference was that both David and Jimmy agreed from the very outset on a wait and see approach and that they would put no time scale to this project. No record companies putting any pressure on them. They would show up at 10 a.m. in the morning and they would work on material for like six hours and then regroup mentally. They would work on this until they got it right. As a matter of fact, uh, David even saying he would uh, record some of his vocals thinking it was done, but then Jimmy would layer guitars over that as was his want and David would say that he sounded like a compressed uh, Kenny Rogers. His vocals would get thin and he would have to re-record them with new attitude to match the attitude that Jimmy added on his guitars. And you know what folks, I hear that on this album and maybe it's that attitude that uh, almost evolving kind of sound throughout the album that makes it such a great car album for me because on a trip you have a limited time but there is a progression and it's so easy to follow the progression of this album. Now they also covered their entire songwriting approach at this press conference and uh, the reporters asking if Jimmy had any input whatsoever regarding lyrics and Jimmy immediately said no, that he did not provide actual lyrics, but he would just give his general input. Uh, they would agree on the general outlay of the story within the song. You know, after Jimmy said that, David broke in and said, you know, uh, the song Take Me For A Little While, he had actually just written placeholder lyrics for that song, and that after him and Jimmy began uh, working on it in earnest, he started writing other lyrics and started singing that, and Jimmy just put a stop to that immediately and said, wait a minute, what are you doing? And uh, he says, I like those original lyrics. And so he, uh, David said that this was one of those songs that was written uh, in a hurry, quickly, and was complete, but for whatever reason, he never saw it as complete, and that it was Jimmy that saw that the song was truly complete. Wonderful partnership here. Now, another thing I noticed about this album is there is a lot of mid-range guitar playing on this album. And when I found out that this album was purposefully recorded on analog equipment only, that explained a whole lot to the tonalities that you hear on this album. This is guitar and vocals recorded the way they should for rock and roll. And David even said that he thought that the new digital technology was wonderful and there's a lot to be explored with that. But for just a good rock and roll sound, nothing beats analog equipment. When asked what was Jimmy's favorite song on the album, he said, shake my tree. And I gotta tell you, 
That's a favorite of mine as well. You know what? There is no particular track that stands out on this album. They are all so excellent and on an almost even level throughout. It is one of those rare classic rock albums that you can listen from the very beginning to the very end and just want to turn that sucker back over and do it all over again. So. The question on the thumbnail was, is this Jimmy Page's very best post Led Zeppelin work? And I say a wholehearted, yes, it is. Now I'm not saying he hasn't done some excellent work. I love his live playing with the Black Crows. Uh, it's not that. This is Jimmy Page almost as focused as he was at the very best Led Zeppelin level and a whole lot more focused than he was during the time that Led Zeppelin recorded In Through the Outdoor. A return to form for Jimmy and a return to an older approach of vocals for David. I love this album. It is one of my favorite albums in rock and roll, but that's my opinion. And I'm sure the tribe will let me know in the comments whether I'm right or wrong on that. But uh, anyway, listen, if you enjoyed the video tonight, give it a thumbs up, please. That helps the YouTube algorithm better identify the channel to a larger audience and the channel grows as a result. The names you see in front of me are brand new subscribers. They are there. We are accepting new subscribers up until October 28th and still will give them their shout outs as you see in front of me. But after that, I've got to cease that folks. It's taking up too much time. But if you're signed up to the channel as of October 28th, you will get your shout out. I guarantee it. Now, if you haven't subscribed to the tribe as of yet, it's so easy. Just hit that subscribe to the tribe button, hit that top bell icon, and you'll be notified of all of my future videos. I'm Michael Nolan. This is The Bottom Line, and I'll see you in my next video.